Braille, Français et Anglais. Détaillé disponible sur site internet Association études haïtiennes. Uh, Tant pis, partagez information ça dans le réseau nouveau. Merci. Thank you, Rebecca. Now we can go finally good to uh, Professor Emmanuel. Do you see my transparency? Yes, we see it, Evan. I just wanted to let everyone know closed captioning is available. You will click on closed captioning and allow subtitles to get Creole translations. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. And uh, sorry for some uh, pronouncement um, in this, but I will try to, to speak uh, slowly. And if, uh, if you want, I can speak Creole and some other one will have to translate. So we are going to, to talk a little bit about uh, some uh, environmental phenomena uh, and uh, the geology of Haiti in, uh, in the perspective to understand effects on environment, on water resources, and also on human health. So as you know, Haiti share with uh, Dominican Republic the, the island of uh, Hispaniola. So uh, Dominican Republic uh, occupied uh, two third part of, uh, of the island and Haiti one third. So uh, what is uh, very important to, to understand uh, on uh, uh, Caribbean island or Caribbean region, it's a zone constituted by uh, islands, small island and the ocean plays an important uh, aspect in that region. In, in, in that case, the Caribbean island uh, or the Caribbean region is uh, a specific space exposed to terrific hazard, like uh, earthquake, hurricane, inundation, etc. So specifically to understand the effects of uh, uh, those phenomena on Haiti, it's very important to to know something about the specific uh, geophysical environment of Haiti. Basically, Haiti is uh, a country with important mountains. And most of the mountains have like uh, the geological formation limestone. So what is the problem with this kind of uh, uh, of a geological formation. The, the most important problem is the presence of cost. The cost is when we have a limestone which has some hole that's been on surface pollution, doesn't take time to go to groundwater and also facilitate during some uh, uh, environmental action displacement of, uh, of solid of soils with possibility to provoke accident on uh, living people. So earthquake provoke not merely liquefaction of soils, facilitate also landslide and also the destruction of habitats which has the last one, like consequences, uh, contributed to, 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 to increase uh, the creation of slums uh, in, uh, in cities, slum where people do not have infrastructure or um, a public infrastructure, like a water, uh, supply water, like a sanitation, like a health services, like school for, for, for students. And uh, is a kind of, uh, of uh, environment where poverty and uh, is, is uh, always present. In terms of effects of that, as you know, the region where is Haiti is not so far um, the region in the world where we, we receive much rain 
and then the temperature seems to be higher and higher. That means we have in the zone, or we are in the zone, where the negative effects of climate change could be more important than another zone. So we have two important consequences. The first one is uh, in on this flood, and the second one is Baron Kijaudil Tesek Sisges. Okay. Particularly in Haiti, with the mountains, with uh, the possibility of uh, hurricane, with the possibility of uh, earthquake, we must try to wonder what could be the effect on natural resources and also on human health. The predominance of limestone give brought to water hardness. But the problem of water hardness is before 1957, uh, uh, people working in WHO and in health knew that uh, hardened wa water doesn't have effect on human health. So the question water hardness is constituted from, uh, basically by magnesium and calcium. So when the concentration of magnesium in water hardness is lower than seven milligrams per, per liter, there is a possibility to generate cardiovascular disease. And the specific case of AT, this disease is the third one of mortality in 2000 in province particularly. Studies uh, carried out of uh, several water plants in AT show a total hardness of 200 milligrams per liter with a concentration of magnesium lower than seven. All the pollutants, that's uh, probably by uh, anthropogenic actions, but also by, uh, by, by source, is the concentration of lead of chromium in not merely groundwater, but also in drinking water. There is also a problem of fluorine, fluorine from zero to two. But if you permit me, if you allow me to, 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 to return on need, we must say that the concentration from 40 to 90 is greater than the, the, the limit of, uh, of this uh, substance in drinking water, where the, the trace food value is only 10, but we are between four times to nine times in, uh, in drinking water. But for, for fluorine, it's a very different. Zero to two milligrams means that specifically for children, a concentration uh, from zero to one facilitate a kind of uh, teeth problem. And also over 1.5, not merely uh, for children, but also for adult people. It's specifically in, uh, in the zone of Akaye or Kabaref for people who know Haiti. This is a plain zone with uh, sedimentary formation and alluvial aquifers. We find 1.5. It's a very important in that case to, 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 to assess health risk assessment to find for that people because it's a very important answer. The main question is, what kind of possibility has Haiti to conduct studies, research uh, on that? Or to understand the effects before talking about money, the first picture here, the first graph we have here, show when the country do not, doesn't have problem of hurricane, there is an increase of, uh, of uh, G GDP. But in 2008, with four hurricanes, 
we had here a decrease. But in 2010, with the earthquake, the, 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 the graph was completely uh, lower than zero. Something presented uh, in uh, Nouvelis uh, last year show in uh, from 2018 to today, there is a negative growth in the, in, in the economy. So what kind of activities or what kind of investments, what kind of money needs in this country, not only to protect the actual environment, to develop research, in the perspective to protect or to manage the, the different environmental risks generated by uh, 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 the different uh, problem we, we have presented in, in that presentation. So we do not have answer, but we have uh, some proposal that uh, I suppose uh, HSC and uh, members and uh, scholars will think about them in order to, 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 to develop or to do something together. I think personally that AT is a well fit uh, laboratory in environmental sciences. So that's when there's a possibility to develop strong scientific partnership in integrated management of water resources in water quality, medical geology, health risk assessment, earthquake, and soil ecofiction. Also, uh, since AT is in a zone where climate change could have very important negative effects, it will be very interesting to ask or to, uh, the possibility to work on the work construction of hydrometeorological data on AT. Scientific partnership on climate change, viability and impacts on groundwater resources, particularly in coastal areas. Well, as you know, um, uh, there are mountains, but also coastal zones. And during the, the, the dry season, uh, uh, people take water from the coastal zone to, 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 to feed, to supply. Um, all the people living in the mountains. But today, all of the, the groundwater in coastal zone uh, know uh, a salinity contamination. It's very important to, 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 to make a correlation between climate change, the um, uh, uh, increase of uh, sea level, uh, in order to understand uh, what, what are the, the different effects of that phenomenon on uh, one water quality, particularly in coastal zone in AT. But the, the most important thing to finish is the possibility to, 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 to develop uh, uh, citizen question, uh, questioning on science policy relation in the view to see when the, the, the state, uh, the, 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 the government and, uh, of AT will accept to finance uh, uh, scientific research. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for my English pronunciation. So um, I try to answer if possible to, to, to the front. Are we ready for the next uh, presentation? Yes, I'm finished. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll very quickly go to something that um, uh, does relate directly to what's just been said by Professor Emmanuel, and that is from Florence Sergio, uh, whose first um, foray into environment was at, with her master's program 
And uh, she was doing an assessment of all of the environment, the flora, the fauna, the habitats around what is now the Citadel National Monument and found quite a bit of great interest. That's most interesting project. And there are possibilities there for a, a wonderful education project, not only for school children, but also for the thousands of visitors that that site has every year. Uh, her consultations for the OA, uh, OAS, the USAID, and the National Environment Action Plan uh, set forth detailed workable plans for stabilizing the environment and setting up educational programs that would ensure a wide awareness. And one of her continuing projects is the Audubon Society of Haiti, and she's done a bird book for children. I think all of these educational moments are of great consequence to our environmental studies going forward. She did have a, a MacArthur grant for designing an environmental education program that was to be done in the primary and secondary schools in collaboration with Haitian artists and Haitian teachers and to make a basic program that could be replicated anywhere in Haiti using use, uh, easily available local materials and, and always in consultation with local teachers. This would avoid the use of expensive outside materials uh, imported that might, uh, might be or might not be related to Haiti. Uh, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, this is not Florence speaking, the program met with some success. Well, that was clear to everyone but it encountered two roadblocks. One was a strongly expressed preference for some of the teachers for materials in French only, not Creole, and for using imported teaching materials. And the other roadblock was the perennial problem in Haitian education, the lack of funds from the government. She also uh, worked with a group of people, Jocelyn Bidmer, um, even Shermond and J. Glenn Morris, on a vision for water in Haiti, which we have just uh, heard some very interesting aspects of that. And I would just like very quickly to quote, the issue with water in Haiti is not that the resource is insufficient, but that it is inadequately distributed and poorly managed. Water quality has been degraded because of social and demographic shifts over time in conjunction with acute and chronic impacts from land use, infrastructure deterioration, and changes in climate. 62% of urban, 34% of rural residents have access to distributed water. However, during 2000 to 2012, a smaller percentage of the population in both settings used an improved water source and uh, was protected from exterior um, contamination. But water treatment practices are not yet widespread, and nearly three in 10 households drink untreated water. Saline contamination threatens major urban aquifers, such as the Plain de Cour de Sac aquifer, which provides water to 60% of the population in Port au Prince. I'm skipping. The population of currently, uh, Haiti is currently greater than 10 million expected to increase to 14 million during the next 20 years. Consumption rates, quality of water resources available to meet growing demand place an increasing emphasis on the need for water governance and management. Um, they had a plan for dealing with regulation of potable water through a decentralized system of regional authorities. However, in other aspects of water management, fall under the jurisdiction of six different national ministries, each governed by its own rules and functioning within its own budget, making it difficult to develop a coordinated approach. This situation is further complicated by the more than 50 non-governmental organizations actively uh, participating in water and sanitation sector. Although targets for water and sanitation have been included in the sustainable development goal, the challenge lies in identifying effective interventions that respond to the diversity of water delivery, uh, which includes wells, community treatment centers, kiosks, water trucks, water sachets, and bottled water. The presumption 
the groundwater is potable does not necessitate, uh, necessitate further treatment if derived from engineered sources, that's not necessarily true. A fact that underscores the need for secondary treatment approaches at the community level that balance quantity, quality, accessibility with cost. Diarrheal diseases remain a major public health challenge, illnesses caused by pathogens transmitted by contaminated water. And with these admonishments, I conclude on behalf of Florence Thurgeel. Thank you. I believe the next person is uh, uh, John uh, Viner from um, FOPROBEM, Ocean Matters for an Island Nation. John? Yes, thank you, LaGrace. Can everybody hear me? Good. All right. So thank you, LaGrace. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, I know we've been working on this for a very long time. Uh, I'll set my timer, as was recommended. <laughs> Uh, but um, yes, yeah, so, so I'd like to discuss coastal and marine issues in Haiti for a little while. Uh, but just a quick background is that we've been, FOPRO BIM has been working in Haiti for almost 30 years now in coastal and marine issues. Uh, fisheries, coral reefs, seagrass beds, mangroves, etc. So we have uh, concentrated a lot of our efforts these days up in the northeast of Haiti in the Three Bays National Park. However, we have worked everywhere from the far Northeast all the way down through the entire country and even over to Navassa Island. Um, we are currently working on the primary issues related to coastal marine resources. So in Haiti, overfishing, uh, marine pollution, uh, the cutting of mangroves, climate change, and some of the destruction of coral resources. For the overfishing issue, it's, of course, um, I mean, this is a, the overfishing issue is a global issue, of course. And in Haiti, it's one of the issues which I think really, really is at the top of the list in terms of what needs to be, to be addressed because we have a poor population which is seriously uh, dependent upon coastal and marine resources and fisheries in particular. Another issue which is, which is very serious is the cutting of mangrove trees along the coastal and marine, along the, uh, along the coast. And these serve, of course, as a uh, refuge for a wide variety of biodiversity, as well as uh, wind breaks that protect uh, local coastal communities from storm surges, from uh, hurricane winds, which of course we're having an amazing year this year. Uh, fortunately, so far Haiti's been been spared mostly. And for the mangrove issue, it's also um, a lot of people consider it a deforestation issue, and of course it's all linked. But I tend to consider it a fuel issue in Haiti, at least, and uh, uh, of course as in most other poor countries the trees are used as a fuel source. So if we can monitor, manage, and uh, get our fuel issue under control, I think that a lot of the deforestation issues in Haiti could be better managed. I'm not saying that it would completely go away, but I believe that in large part, the fuel issue is what's driving most of the deforestation. For uh, the climate change issues, of course, as a small uh, developing island nation, uh, we have the vast majority of our population in coastal areas and rising sea level is already causing serious issues. Uh, the pictures and, and firsthand observations that we made during these past uh, rainy seasons, especially the last one, especially up in uh, Cape Haitian, as well as down in Port-au-Prince, the Carrefour, Matissan area. I mean, people were, were walking around in, you know, four or five feet of water on the main roads. There was, there was literally geysers of, 
uh, of filthy water and rainwater shooting out from manholes in a lot of these areas as well. And as one of my friends from another development agency uh, said at one point, Port-au-Prince is one of the few country, one of the few cities where after a big rainstorm, you actually see huge rocks and boulders often in the middle of the streets. For the issues related to coral and seagrass beds, uh, for coral in particular, um, Haiti still has a, a big issue with the export of corals for aquaria, uh, aquaria curio, and for just decorating. And it is an issue which is often being, being uh, unfortunately managed by people in, in high places who know better, and of course, who are taking advantage of the situation to to take advantage to sell these items on the open market. Uh, we have worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as NOAA in trying to stop this, uh, because a lot of the other countries in the Caribbean and, of course, throughout the Pacific have stopped the exploitation of their coral reefs. Um, but it's a tough one, especially in a country, as we all know, where the rule of law, especially lately, has gone by the wayside. Uh, so we're left as one of the few institutions, if not the only institution, really trying to fight this. Along the same lines, along, well, along similar lines, the exploitation of sea turtles is a major issue. Um, we pretty much every other country in the Caribbean has enacted and, and is enforcing laws related to the monitoring and managing and protection of sea turtles. And Haiti, right smack dab in the middle, is probably the only country where sea turtles are completely unprotected um, at all phases of their life, from adults to, all the way down to eggs. Uh, I believe in 2017, there was a major uh, bust uh, for which in, which included uh, sea turtle shells, which I believe were transiting through France on their way to Asia, and I think it was several tons of sea turtle shells. So things like that. Um, again, we're very pragmatic, if you will, along the lines of what needs to be done and how. We are dealing with a country in which, you know, just take a step back. And I really can't understand or stand it when people come to Haiti and start yelling and screaming at people, telling them that, you know, you have to stop cutting trees, you have to stop eating sea turtles, you have to stop eating this, and you have to stop exploiting this and that. Where, the, of course, their stomachs are full, and the people who are doing it in general um, are are not doing so well and are hungry. So being pragmatic about it, being understanding, I believe really, really will go a long way. Um, certain times, of course, uh, for us in particular, the protection of manatees, which are almost unheard of, unseen in Haiti in recent years, uh, I think stopping them, that type of exploitation outright is very important. But for things such as cutting down mangroves for firewood or charcoal production, uh, the exploitation of sea turtles for food, um, I think we need to provide the options. Uh, you can also educate people until you're blue in the face, um, but you also have to provide the options. So what we've been doing is providing the educational activities, educational materials for adults, for fishermen, for government sector officials for schools and trying to um, educate people on their importance, the importance of monitoring and managing and protecting them, but also providing the options. So engaging in apicultural activities uh, with the local coastal communities that we engage with. Uh, we have ca uh, kayaking set up in Fort Liberté now for ecotourism activities for the fishermen. Uh, there is uh, bread fruit flour now going on in one of our communities. So really trying to find the options, I think that that is unbeatable. 
Um, I can no longer tell anybody here to quit their job and to stop doing what they're doing and not provide an option. Then I can go tell somebody in Haiti to do the same. So uh, we're working on all of these types of activities. It's critical that we have government support, of course, in many cases, because we need the government to play its role in governance and in management, which of course are two different things. Governance cannot be done by individuals or NGOs or anybody else. Management, of course, uh, we can take care of through private sector, NGOs and things along and organizations along those lines. So critically important that we have everybody working together. We know that there's a lot of weaknesses in government institutions but we also need to work with them as best we can. Um, and we're often asked to provide the government with uh, support in various ways, which we are oftentimes very happy to do. But monitoring, managing education and providing the options, critically important. And I believe at least the only way that we're going to get out of this. I think I have two seconds left. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and we will very quickly go on uh, to Mark Cohen, who is going to, uh, who's with Oxfam, and he's going to speak on effective environment roles for NGOs. Uh, Mark, you're on. Thank you very much, and uh, merci en pile. And uh, I bring greetings to the group from the land of the Dog. Uh, Algonquin people, otherwise known as Northern Virginia. Uh, I uh, Just to situate what I'm going to talk about, I think we're dealing this afternoon uh, with a set of paradoxes. Uh, a majority of Haitians depend on their natural environment and natural resources for their livelihoods. Uh, they work uh, producing crops, uh, uh, raising livestock in forestry, fishing, retail and wholesale marketing, and agricultural processing. And if we look at agriculture more narrowly than that uh, broad uh, 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 picture, uh, it's about 20% of the economy and 50% of employment. But at the same time, uh, the rural parts of Haiti are extremely uh, poor uh, with uh, about 90% of rural Haitians living below the national poverty line. And thinking also about how the environment and natural resources sustain lives and livelihoods, there's also an element of harshness as we've already heard, uh, the island is pretty much on the main pathway of Atlantic hurricanes. Uh, although as, as was said, we've been lucky this season. Uh, and climate change has led to more frequent and more intense uh, disasters from natural hazards. Uh, I'm not going to call them natural disasters. Uh, the hazards are natural, the disasters, uh, not so much. Uh, but, but just to think of the examples of Hurricane Matthew in 2016 and uh, uh, multiple periods of quite punishing droughts since uh, 2015. So thinking about uh, uh, what international NGOs uh, and national uh, Haitian NGOs can do in this nexus, if you like, of nature, wealth, and power, uh, uh, I, I will talk a bit about what uh, Oxfam has done, uh, and this is a bit of a retrospective because uh, Oxfam is closing its office in Haiti at the end of next year, but we have been working in the country with Haitian partners uh, for more than 40 years. Um, so I will give a, a few samples of our work related to uh, the environment and natural resources, and this is not at all exhaustive. Uh, a big focus of our work has been resilient and sustainable agriculture. Uh, we have worked with uh, uh, cooperatives of both rice and uh, dairy farmers, uh, with peanut farmers, uh, 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 ground nuts 
if you're from a different part of uh, uh, the, a different side of the pond. Uh, small scale processing enterprises uh, and with uh, women's organizations that are involved in rural development, including uh, SOFA, uh, Solidarité, FAM, ICN. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, and, and I won't say the Ministry of Agriculture, it's the Ministry of Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Rural Development. So it's one of the ministries that Florence mentioned is responsible for uh, uh, environmental policy. And the schools of agriculture at both uh, the State University and the University of Kiskea. Uh, within this work, uh, after the earthquake, uh, we worked with uh, 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 several different uh, uh, rice cooperatives and farmers associations in the lower Artibonite Valley on uh, piloting what is called the system of rice intensification. This is an agroecological approach to rice, uh, which uses uh, low levels of external input. So a big emphasis on compost for fertilizer, uh, very uh, specific patterns of using seed, so not broadcasting the seed, and a water conserving approach. And this is aimed at increasing the producti productivity of rice production. Another area in which we've worked that uh, is very much related to the environment and what we've been talking about so far today is uh, the building of resilience. Uh, our partners in this have been uh, not only government agencies, uh, particularly the Directorate of uh, Civil Protection and its uh, representatives at the de département and commune level, uh, and uh, commune sectionale level as well, but also community-based organizations and volunteers. Uh, and the focus here is on disaster risk reduction and disaster response. Uh, preparedness, and uh, particularly in the uh, water sanitation and hygiene sector, another area we've talked about uh, today. And again, uh, this work has primarily been in the Département of the Artibonite. Uh, turning to the work I've been involved in myself, uh, Oxfam uh, uh, perhaps uh, more so than some international NGOs, also does a lot of uh, advocacy and uh, evidence-based advocacy, so it involves research as well, and that's the area I work on. Um, we have done assessments, independent assessments, of USAID agriculture projects, uh, 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 particularly recently the uh, Feed the Future projects, Winner and Avancé, and both of those have a watershed management focus. Uh, and uh, we uh, found a number of uh, positive uh, aspects to those projects, but also several negative ones. Uh, a lack of uh, engagement of uh, the target populations in project design, uh, uh, big problems with gender, uh, particularly uh, not really challenging the traditional gender division of labor. So although women were beneficiaries of the projects, it was not what we would call gender transformational. And finally, uh, uh, looking specifically at environmental issues, really no engagement of the Ministry of the Environment in uh, uh, either uh, implementation or carrying the gains forward once the project ended, projects ended. Um, we've also done some research on uh, uh, trying uh, uh, the questions related to climate change and particularly how climate change affects agriculture. And uh, I think we've heard quite a bit about that, but obviously with the uh, disasters uh, that has meant uh, 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 very significant negative impacts on agriculture production, both drought and storms uh, in particular. Uh, we've worked on advocacy in Haiti, uh, particularly with uh, FENAPRI, the National Federation of Rice Producers, uh, to uh, help them engage in policy dialogue on supporting domestic rice production. Uh, 
and also uh, improving the operation and maintenance of the irrigation works, obviously irrigated uh, in the Ahdibonit Valley. Obviously, uh, irrigation is one way to address climate change, uh, particularly irrigation that is accessible to small scale farmers. Uh, I think, as you know, there is uh, not much irrigated agriculture in Haiti. It is mostly rain fed. And so uh, that, that uh, magnifies the impact of droughts, obviously. We've also been very much engaged in advocacy in the United States. We were a founding member of the Haiti Advocacy Working Group after the earthquake and its earliest meetings were at our Washington office. We've done a lot of advocacy around US aid to agriculture, uh, using our work, uh, our research on uh, Feed the Future, and also on US agricultural trade policy. So the uh, dumping of US rice and a very, very uh, high promotion of US rice exports to Haiti, as well as uh, the use of peanuts in uh, food aid um, um, more recently. Um, and we've done some transnational advocacy where we've brought our Haitian partners to Washington to meet with US policymakers, uh, particularly uh, partners from POPTA, the Haitian uh, Advocacy Platform for Alternative Development, uh, as well as uh, one of the senior leaders of the Directorate of uh, Civil Protection. Uh, uh, so uh, it's kind of linking the advocacy and the partnerships in Haiti uh, uh, with advocacy in Washington, DC. And um, as I mentioned, our, our, we are closing our program in Haiti uh, next year, uh, but we certainly hope uh, uh, to maintain relationships with the part, uh, through the partnerships we've developed and uh, uh, hope that some of this work over the last four plus decades uh, uh, will be sustained. So thank you very much, Messi and Pile. And you're on mute, LaGrace. Oh. Thank you very much, Mark Cohen, for your excellent presentation. And I'm going to give a very short report uh, on behalf of Lambe. They could not be with us because uh, they are very much engaged in a project which I will mention. Um, I just first like to remember Lambe's founder, Marie Marcel Bouteau Racine, who passed away on 27th of July this year. She was certainly uh, a, not only a founder, but a guiding spirit all through the many years that she worked very closely and energetically, and she leaves an important legacy. I have followed Lambie work since meeting with her many years ago when the organization first began. And Lambie has often presented at HSA conferences. So many people on this uh, program will be already familiar with their work. A direct observation at some of their sites yields a most encouraging view of what is possible on the ground in Haiti done by Haitians. One of the signal projects was developing a method for cloning from especially productive plantains and then producing succeeding generations of high yield fields. The central project for this was in the Artibonite. Other projects observed involved water management, the establishment of new, numerous plant nurseries for a wide variety of food plants, building projects for housing and related shelters, establishment of primary schools, development of local grain mills owned and operated by people in the community, animal husbandry projects, gardens for herbs with surplus to be sold in local markets. All of this is planned in community sessions with everyone participating. Experienced leaders make sure that everyone has a time to speak and the decisions are made by consensus. The work is accomplished in the same fashion, thus continuing a centuries old tradition and habit of combit. There are regular checks on effectiveness so that projects with unsatisfactory yields are modified or discontinued. Nothing goes to waste. And because everyone is known to everyone else, the government is effective and continuous. 
response to the earthquake was immediate, and as well, it was immediate to the 216, 2016 Matthew flood in the south of Haiti. And their latest project is in that area as the damage was extreme. And I'm going to quote from their website. Um, they will launch nine various projects with smallholder farmers in Cavallon, Manich, and Okai to improve family livelihoods and create income generation, generating opportunities in the southwest corridor of Haiti. Efforts will focus on assisting local organizations with agricultural infrastructure, capacity building, ox plowing, uh, ox plowing services, agricultural transformations that continue to improve food security and farming efforts. Projects will vary in all three areas and a total of seven partner organizations in Haiti will benefit. These partner organizations vetted by the Land B Funds Board will receive much needed aid to strengthen their livelihoods. The projects will include community funds for COFECA Women's Organization, the Adro Mill Transformation for Rice, and Upladep storage of grain, also for animal husbandry with goats, oxen, ox plow, and 120,000 seedlings for planting which will address the concerns with the environment. Uh, these projects will uh, provide much needed aid to those organizations that were devastated by Hurricane Matthew and continue to face uncertain weather path patterns due to climate change. The project is funded by a grant from the W. Kate Kellogg Foundation and Marie Mott Sancia, who is the executive director of LAMBI, uh, says, I quote her in closing, we are thankful for the partnership with the Kellogg Foundation that will result in enhancing potential for livelihood and working out of poverty for families and farming communities working together to change the course of their lives. So I think that the communitarian local participation is one of the fundamental ways that Lombi has succeeded so well in their multiple projects. And I thank you very much on behalf of Lombi. And I believe that our next presenter is Gerdes Florent. Gerdes, are you on? Can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, excellent. Can you hear Hello, me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Can you see me? Yes, we can see your picture. Okay, all right. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure. Some, some wonderful presentations. And uh, thank you, the Grace and Lois, uh, for inviting me. Uh, just about a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Lois asked me to say a few words about. Uh, drum makings in the Rada tradition and the environment. And I said, gee, what am I going to, to say? But she quoted uh, a passage from my book and that brought uh, to my attention the work that we have done you know, in Bopo, uh, in Bopo La Plaine with uh, Coyote. So I said, I will say a few words about uh, uh, drum makers, Coyote and at least as an example of Vodou's respect uh, for the environment. Uh, as you will see that uh, drumming uh, is at the heart uh, of the Vodou community and how do you make your drums and uh, the presentation that, that came before me are uh, very eloquent in showing the devastation of the environment. But we'll, you will see that many peristyles and voodoo temples are oasis uh, in the community uh, with uh, a garden, with a green uh, area. Now, uh, Coyote has been at the center of my work for the past uh, uh, close to 40 years. And I would remind everybody that Coyote was the teacher of Maya Deren. Uh, a very well-known name, you know, in the studies and work uh, on the Vodou community. 
And I was very fortunate in the 1980s to be introduced to, to Coyote who taught me uh, the principles of uh, Haitian uh, drumming and, 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 and ritual. And of course, I want to mention the name of Veve Clark because the late Veve Clark uh, was the person who really introduced me uh, to Teji Ito, who was the husband of the third husband of Maya Darren, and Teji Ito, who himself introduced me uh, to Coyote. And we were able to bring Coyote uh, to Boston. He spent three weeks with us. That was our first introduction. And then I was able to pay him a visit uh, back uh, to Bopo. And Coyote introduced me to Prisoa Louis, who was uh, the Hongan who proceeded uh, to help me along in my studies and also in my initiation. But the point here is that if you're going to make a drum, you just don't go to the forest and fell a tree. Uh, there is this kind of respect that one has for nature. Uh, the drum makers uh, as a group will go to the forest and from there, there will be uh, a ceremony. They will have a veve, they will have libation, they will, there will be propitiation because one does not move uh, cavalierly uh, into the forest and fell any tree. So to make uh, a drum, you proceed first with this ceremony. And also you have to wait for the proper phase of the moon because the beliefs in Haitian agriculture is that the moon has a particular uh, influence on uh, the environment, on the trees, on the crops. So the veve that you will make will be veve for Ligba that opens door to all uh, vistas. And then you will go and fell and cut the tree. And there'll be a whole process. So uh, this is uh, one mark of respect for the environment. It's very clear that uh, people who adhere uh, to the principles of voodoo uh, do not move randomly uh, and devastate the environment. Now, what I would like to uh, move on to say uh, what we have tried to do ourselves in Mion Ballet at the Cultural Center and the Gaoginu School. One of the emphasis at the Gaoginu School is that uh, we taught agriculture. We had an agronomist, uh, agent agricole, who would come uh, once a week and work with the children. We also had a little plot where they could uh, practice agriculture. But that was basically on a limited uh, uh, basis. Now, after some 21 years in the area, and we have the opportunity to begin to work on what I call a holistic center. We were able to acquire uh, some seven acres of land on the other side of uh, the La Tombe River and on a piece of land uh, on a hill uh, overlooking the, the new hospitals in Mirbalé. And in the past uh, year and a half, we have been making plans and working on building a holistic center that would have three parts. Of course, there will be a performing center with a very strong emphasis on the artistic, cultural, and spiritual dimensions of voodoo. And there will also be uh, a residence area for people who would come to, uh, for various reasons, uh, for the practice at the cultural, at the holistic center. But uh, in what would be of, and what is of interest to us in terms of voodoo and the environment, uh, we have uh, put together a two acre uh, section of this land, which is in a valley and quite fertile uh, for a botanical garden. And there we have been involved in planting trees 
and many of these trees and, and leaves and woods would be used for the practice, ritual practices. And that is of importance to us. So we have uh, on May 1st uh, of, for the past four years, we have taken students, our children, children uh, from the Gaugino school to go and plant. Uh, I'm not able to show any of that to you because I'm basically out of my environment. I'm speaking to you now in from Florida where I've been for over a year, uh, two events kept me away from Haiti. Uh, the first one was the pay lock, and then now is the COVID-19. So we are here, and I had left Haiti last September uh, 2019 with the intention of returning within two or three weeks, but I've been here for a year and completely out of my environment but I can tell you that what we have been doing uh, is to bring uh, the young people from the Gaugin School in Mirbalé, and many of you who have visited us know what I'm talking about. And so they have visited the area where we have mangoes, uh, avocados, and, and canep and other trees and planting uh, in the area. So the most important part is being that we are planning now in putting a full-fledged botanical garden that will help us uh, cultivate the kind you know, of trees and, and leaves that will be needed uh, for ritual purposes. Uh, we have also planted a mapu tree uh, in the middle of uh, the botanical garden in the past uh, two years and the mapu tree is doing very well. The last thing I would say, uh, a problem that we have been confronting you know, in, uh, in Haiti and particularly in places like Sudo. For those of you who have visited the area, you know that the pilgrims sometime would come and lit candles at the foot of the trees. And as a result, we have lost several trees. And this is due to miseducation because some people thinking that if they put a candle the closest to the tree, uh, their requests, the, the, the demands, the aspirations will be answered. So we have been involved in the process of helping people to understand you don't need to do that. And there are no spiritual entity. There is no law that has, is going to ask anyone to destroy the environment. We have to be very clear about that. Uh, there, uh, there, is, there are some contradictions uh, because you're dealing with a population that is hard depressed economically and that was very nicely articulated by uh, the previous speakers. So the question is how do you get people to transcend the limits of their immediate environment and to go to protection of the environment. So we have been involved in uh, some effort, almost a campaign uh, when I'm here in Sodo. And probably we have to also say when Kosamba uh, came to Haiti in 2009, uh, we went and planted three mapu trees in Sodo. And unfortunately, two of them did not uh, uh, take, but one did very well. And now uh, for more than 10 years, we have a very nice uh, map of tree uh, in at the waterfall, at Sodo at the waterfall. However, again, the pilgrims began to lit candles. So we had to hire people to put some ramparts to protect uh, that tree, which is uh, doing quite well. So uh, in conclusion, uh, it seems that one of uh, the possibilities is not to, uh, is to pay attention uh, to the uh, basic principles in voodoo that respect uh, the environment, that respect the community. It's a big struggle because Haiti is a hard pressed community and all the entities are confronted with the dire problems that we are experiencing there. But uh, it's very clear that part of the solution uh, is 
uh, in the terrestrial, in the food community, in education, in what I call cultural literacy, where uh, people learn their culture, but in a way that it becomes, uh, it's become beneficial to them and to the community. So uh, that's what I had to say, uh, not uh, very much at all, because we ha didn't have much time. Uh, we are out of our environment, but I'm very pleased uh, to have been with you and to see everybody else and to articulate the fact that we should not uh, uh, forget that uh, the Voodoo community is part of the solutions, solution to the problems of the degradation of the environment. So there is a lot that can be done when we get culturally literate voodoo practitioners, and then we'll all be uh, dancing uh, around to a new level, you know, in, in Haiti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gerdes. And it's uh, excellent to have not only the notion of an education, which has been brought up by all the previous speakers, but also something beyond and deeper than education, which is the consciousness, the awareness, the yes. physical, mental, and emotional awareness of the environment that you have spoken of so eloquently. Thank you. And we will move now very quickly to a brief presentation by someone who came to our attention at the last minute, but we just wanted her to be here, and that is um, Ellie Hapel, who has something to say about mining. Ellie? Hi, everyone. Ellie. Hi, yeah. Ellie. Hi. Um, thank you for the warm welcome, and I know I have just a couple minutes. Uh, so my name is Ellie Happel, and I teach the Global Justice Clinic at NYU School of Law. Um, I, I was based in Haiti from 2011 to 2017, and continue to manage our, our work in Haiti, which primarily we are supporting communities that are resisting the development of gold mining. Uh, if for those of you who attended HSA last year, I, I, I presented with three colleagues from Haiti in detail about the threats that, that gold mining poses to Haiti and the way in which they're, they're you know, direct, <laughs> direct threats to the Haitian environment and so many so many of the issues that, that people have spoken about today. So just brief background, uh, as, as many of you probably know, there's, there's currently no mine that's operating in Haiti. I should say no metal mine. Of course, there's sand mining and other forms of mining. And yet after the earthquake, as part of the Haiti is open for business, there was this resurgence of interest in the extractive industry as what the World Bank said would be a path out of poverty for Haiti. Um, in between 2007 and 2012, companies invested an estimated $30 million to explore for gold and other metals in Haiti. It's, it's important to, to note that one of the biggest mines in the world is in the Dominican Republic, the Pueblo Viejo mine. And it's the same vein of gold that goes into Haiti. So companies have, have reason to believe that there is in fact gold in Haiti's soil. Um, just a couple human rights concerns because I know that my, my, my time is quite brief. First, the way that companies have explored for gold to date has been a just complete disregard for local communities. Community members learned that companies held permits and still do hold permits to operate on their land when trucks came into communities, when helicopters landed in very rural communities in the Northwest of Haiti, the Northeast, also the Central Plateau. Um, and, and people have called this just a blackout of information. And um, one of the reactions to the issuance of, of permits that allow companies to actually build a mine was the Senate back in 2013 said, we're calling for a moratorium, no more mining in Haiti. And the government responded to that by inviting the World Bank to come in and redraft Haitian mining law. 
Um, again, I, I will not go into detail about either the procedural problems with that law or the substantive problems with that law, but it's quite clear that it's really investment friendly and, and disregards the interests and well being of Haitian people. Um, so if, if people are interested in this issue, I'm, I'm very happy to connect over email, also on the Global Justice Clinic website of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice of NYU School of Law. You can find more information. Um, and, and I think this really just goes to the question of what model of development is, is a la Haitien, is, is fit for Haiti, responds both to the environmental reality, but also the human reality. And Haiti is, is the densest populated country in this hemisphere. And as, as people have said today, you know, it is a farming society, an agricultural society. And, and one of the very clear demands is just investment in adaptation as the climate changes, investment in agriculture, but not investment in further uh, just extractive model of development. So that's all for now, but thank you so much for having me. Oh, uh, you're on mute. I keep forgetting that. Thank you very much. Ellie, for this very important notice about the mining, and thank you for being able to come in at the last minute. Uh, very important uh, information. And I don't know that we have time for a video we wanted to show. Uh, is it going to be possible to show the short video that uh, Rebecca Sager had or not? Well, maybe we will wait on that, but I'm going to turn the meeting over now to Karen Richmond, who is going to be our um, make a summary and um, lead us into the discussion. Thank you. I'm starting. Thank you very much, everyone, for this wonderfully informative panel that's so diverse. And uh, I, I was thinking about you know, the themes that uh, sort of capture the diversity of your presentations. And while there are lots of things to be very concerned about, um, and the last presentation, of course, just invokes the horrid memories of the occupation, right? Where people were pursued from the land, from the air, from the sea, for resisting the kinds of schemes that you're talking about, Ellie, right? Like the rewriting of constitution to enable foreigners who were often greedy and ill prepared to, to uh, develop their projects and then of course re-enslave Haitians as corvée labor right to work on these ill-advised projects that usually came to naught so there's a lot that's negative with uh, the with the results of climate change and these env environmental hazards and the uh, the terrible human suffering that comes from it but there were some positive things, some positive uh, things that we heard about in this panel, and I think it's really important to celebrate that. Um, Gerdes, uh, when you talked about three Mapu were planted, two died, but one survived, right? And, and it's thriving, and that's at the center. And I think that that's sort of a, a symbol for um, what can be done with re uh, with respecting the knowledge that Haitian that all Haitians have and um, and promoting that and just embracing cultural literacy right and enhancing people's knowledge of the environment because um, ordinary Haitians understand their environment very well and for too long their understanding and respect for the environment has been disrespected. Um, Jean Wiener, you talked about how arrogant it is for foreigners to go in and you know point at people well you're killing the sea turtles or you're harvesting the eggs well that's easy for someone whose belly is full right and who's maybe enjoyed uh, turtle soup at some extravagant restaurant um, but the issue is not not providing options and also promoting options and valorizing the the sustainable practices that people already have and that they already know about um, Mark, I don't, I'm curious, I don't know the history of Oxfam's decision to leave Haiti. I think that would be very interesting <laughs> to find out about. But you talked about uh, another reason for hope, which is advocacy 
you know, uh, that uh, people in the struggle, both inside and outside of Haiti, challenging certain policies that are just going to exacerbate the uh, immiseration of more people and, and they're having to um, contribute, uh, unfortunately, to the destruction of the environment. The policies having to do with um, forced importation of, of, of rice, for example, and the issue with the peanuts. Uh, Lagrice, you gave us, in talking about some of the projects of the Lombi Fund in the area devastated by um, a Hurricane Mathieu, right? Another example of the only, the only way forward, the only path forward is through respect, right, through partnerships, through local uh, for people making decisions together, right, and for uh, decisions coming out of the solidarity between um, the different uh, people who are who who are the ones who will most benefit from um, these projects and will be hurt by um, by uh, projects of people doing good badly. I think that I covered everyone, um, and I just. Gerdes, in your typically eloquent way, you talked about something that I'd like to just end with. You said, you know, uh, the, the Vodou community, the community in general, right, is this part of the solution. They are the solution. And you said, and when that's, when they are empowered and respected, you said, quote, then we will be dancing around to a new level in Haiti. And I wanted to add, then we'll be dancing around that Mapu to a new level in Haiti. Merci en pile, merci en pile. <laughs> Karine, merci. Uh, it's a pleasure. Okay, we will all be dancing. Okay, so uh, to open up the discussion, uh, Karen has uh, summarized the um, presentations and I think we are open now for uh, participants to to uh, uh, our participants to uh, bring up other points with each other and to open up uh, for questions. And I'm not in charge of this part, so I'm not quite sure what to do here. <laughs> I'm going to uh, just open it up and see what happens. Uh, I guess we've got uh, our tech people back there in the background that will help us open this discussion up. Okay, we have 38 participants. So do we have some questions on, uh, do we have some questions and answers? No open questions. We have some chats, we have- uh, It seems like there's somebody called Tisha who wants Jean to talk more about uh, endangered baby eels. Um, in Haiti and the commerce of these? Oh, thank you, Josiane. Um, Jean, could you respond? Sure, absolutely. Um, the, the, uh, the commerce of the baby eels, the American eel in Haiti has, has come about I think we've, we saw an explosion of this uh, starting a little bit after the earthquake. Um, there are a lot of people from Southeast Asia that ended up in Haiti. Um, we believe that some of it started from uh, um, some of the Koreans who arrived with the startup of the Caracol Industrial Park, especially in the northeast of Haiti. And it exploded into one of the largest fisheries Haiti has ever seen. Um, I believe numbers are a little hazy, but I believe when all of this started back in the early 2000s in places like uh, Massachusetts and Maine, that people were, were um, getting something like $20,000 or $15,000 a kilo for a kilo <laughs> of baby eels. And these were taken to... Uh, farms in Southeast Asia where they were grown out. So you'd get an eel, maybe, you know, about the length of your, your pinky, 
and they would be grown out. And I can never remember. There's a type of sushi that is made with them in Southeast Asia. And um, pretty much every river in Haiti is now farmed for eels, uh, I believe from about September through March, perhaps or so. Um, almost all of the other fisheries in the country stop when the, the eel season comes around. For us, we're debating whether it's a bad thing for the fisheries in Haiti, because for those six months, the rest of the fisheries get to recover. So um, to a certain extent, we had to decide if we want to sacrifice one local species, perhaps, which probably won't disappear because it's just Haiti, which has gone insane in this, for the benefit of all the other species in, in Haitian waters, including um, lobster and conch and all types of finfish. So in Haiti right now, I believe they're, they're somewhere around seven to $8,000 a kilo of, uh, for, for these eels. And everyone, when it's season, does it. We've come across kids who have a little cut off plastic bottle of, of water who have like one eel in it and are looking for uh, the, the, the main guy who's going to collect them all and, and, and ship them out. So the government or people in the government at one time were also uh, and are still, let's say, very heavily involved in this. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of comments, uh, two comments that have come in that we do uh, would like to address because we have given some thought uh, to this and we will give more thought to this. Uh, and there is the notion that these presentations have been uh, valuable enough uh, to uh, proceed so that we set up a continuing program so that these issues can be continuing to be in front of the people, at least of her Haitian studies. And we do have some plans so that I hope that your remarks, I hope you will retain copies of your remarks so that we can begin to be, this is the beginning. This is the stage one of what we hope will be a long process where there's an environmental consciousness project going on for some time. Um, and so let's see, there was another question that to you, I think, um, uh, yes. Um, no, that's even a third one about how HSA can collaborate to support projects on the environment in Haiti. And one of those, of course, is we do have this special issue coming out. And um, that's one, that's the next step. That will be the next step that we will see. But we do hope to continue this and any suggestions for ways to continue it will be very, very welcome by both Lois and I. Lois has been, done tremendous amount of work on setting this up. And I hope that we will be in contact with her as well. She has a very good grasp on this. Um, now, uh, let's see. There are other questions here and I'm missing them. I'm not seeing them. I'm seeing current questions. Um, um, Josiane, are you seeing some of the questions? Uh, how do we make sure that any profit of the mines stay with the Haitian community if we permit mining, something like that? Oh, yes, good. That's by Ellie Hapel. Ellie? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. So first, I would say there, there's not good international track record of multinational companies. In fact, ensuring that that the the wealth that is generated from mining does stay in communities, and I think there are some specific concerns in Haiti. I mean, first would be corruption, and really it would be the role of the government to ensure that whatever revenue is generated from mining is then translated into into public good. Um, and yet, you know, the the events of recent years doesn't suggest that this government has the, the capacity to do that. Um, but further, the, the mining law that the World Bank 
redrafted, you know, in in collaboration with Haitian government officials, it doesn't provide for. I mean, it 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 really lacks um, provisions to protect communities, and also lacks provisions to ensure that some of the the royalties would go back to communities. Um, I mean, one glaring problem with the law is it's completely silent on people who will be displaced. And due to population density in Haiti, we we would anticipate that you know any industrial modern industrial mine would require hundreds, if not thousands, of families to be relocated. And yet, there's no guidance in the law about what would happen with those families. So, I mean, I you know it it's unfortunate to be so skeptical, and yet. I think Haitian communities, I mean, one of the advantages is that they can learn from what has happened in other parts of the world. And it, it you know, there are very few examples where communities benefit from mining. Just the last concrete example I'll give is the, um, the Yanacocha mine in Peru has generated money for the Peruvian government at a national level. And yet the communities that are in proximity to the mine prior to construction of the mine were like in the middle range of, of livelihood well-being and other economic measures. And once the mine was constructed, the this this entire region, that's the Cajamarca region in Peru, it's now the 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 poorest and most impoverished region in the country. Um, and so I, you know, I think looking, looking, looking elsewhere to, for, for lessons learned is an important step. And yet there just isn't inspiring precedent on community uh, enrichment. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, we have another question here from Rachel Doug Douglas. Uh, she said, uh, did I mention something about showing us a film? So I'm going to ask again, Rebecca, can you hear me? And is that film able to be shown? I mean, I'm asking out techie people at the same time. Yes, uh, let, me, we, let no? me give it a try. Um, I'm going to screen share, okay. but I'd like to give you just a little bit of information first. This is a co-creative collaborative process um, that has taken place over many years with a dear family friend of ours that I think that most of you um, have um, great familiarity with. Uh, and that is Kumperfilo. Um, who recently passed away, as you know. So this screening is um, also going to be, uh, um, you know, beloved um, memoriam for um, his his departure to the ancestors. Um, we uh, collaborated also with the artist BIC, who is well known for his socially engaged lyrics, and also with the filmmaker Kendi Verilus, who has been involved in a number. Um, of uh, similar activist uh, documentary projects as well. Um, again, all longtime collaborators, and um, we hope that this speaks to the um, message of what we're talking about today in terms of environmental justice and um, helping to share information about the importance of um, the environment and trees in particular. So I'm going to screen share and see if my internet is strong enough to keep this video going. Rebecca, can you get the sound up? I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you very much uh, for, for that uh, very lovely uh, presentation. I'm glad we were able to show it. I do think we have um, uh, some more questions and I think we have a few more minutes that we can answer those questions um, now with that inspiration of the, of the film and the, and the wonderful music from uh, very good people. Um, uh, this is one that says, how from the point of view of HSA can we create ongoing conversations and spaces for collaboration in between conferences? How can also we as an association bridge the gap between knowledge and policy? Uh, that's a huge question. And uh, I want to go uh, immediately to another comment by Andrew Tarter um, as a continuation. So far, most panelists have pointed out environmental destruction is economically driven, uh, driven. And his question has proposed solutions of education, advocacy, cons conservation, combating corruption, voodoo. Uh, how are they going to make a difference and at what scale? Um, and so who would like to um, answer that question, which is a very good complex question. It's enough for another whole two hours, Andrew. So, was that- Could I jump in here? Yeah, sure. This is Gary. I think it's, I, this is Gary. I think it's important for La Grace, for you and Lois to talk about what we're trying to do with uh, the working group on the environment, the Combit. I think that addresses some of the questions raised by Andrew. Um, yes, it, it might, um, it might, can you hear me? Am I being heard? I hear you fine. Okay. Um, 
I think that uh, the question is very large and we are trying to work on it and our first stage of working on it um, is in somewhat in parallel with Rebecca's uh, special issue of, of the, um, in the special environmental issue. That is one stage. And I hope everybody who has presented today will propose, will send a proposal in by the 15th of November for consideration of inclusion. These have been important contributions. Uh, we also want to set up a blog that would be linked to the HSA site. And to have this as a blog, not for people just to say, I feel this, I feel that, what of this and what is that, 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 that we get on Twitter, but a, um, a somewhat peer reviewed blog that will pose questions and then pose answers so that there's a back and forth conversation on that blog. Uh, we have some other ideas about uh, presence on social media and, and perhaps even on YouTube. Those are all complicated things that require staff um, and we'll, we'll need some support. We can do so much as volunteers. And I think all of you, everybody on this panel has worked as a volunteer somewhere at some point or has worked professionally and not gotten paid for it. So we all know that there needs to be some infrastructure and that part of, the, uh, part of our efforts is going to have to be to get some support for a very serious ongoing consideration that will take all of these questions into um, to present the questions and to hear answers. It's a complicated project. The more I think about it, the more I think I might retire after all <laughs> and go away into the sunset. But there will be other people who can pick that up for sure. So Lois and I are going to be the people who start this and we will take all suggestions, but we do intend to have a continuing presence about environmental issues. That's the short answer, Andrew, and I hope that you will be one of the contributors. Thank you for your question. So do we have some other questions? Or comments? Um, where are we now? Where are our tech people? Can anybody hear me? What's up? What's up? Okay, uh, I think some people are being heard and some people are not. And I was trying to um, get to the other questions and somehow I'm not getting to them. And I'm not getting to the other chats. The Grace, I think most of the questions are appearing on the chat screen rather than the Q&A screen. Okay. I can't start a new questions on the Q and A stream. Okay. It's only on the chat. Stream. I, I do see. I do see another question up here, uh, which is a question for Jean. And what is the potential for marine aquaculture in Haiti? It's a good question, Jean. No, it's a very good question, and um, we have to separate things in two here. One is what we're calling mariculture, which would be the, the development of ocean farming for fish or, or, or seafood, and aquaculture, which would be the terrestrial land-based farming of fish in ponds. Um, Haiti has had very bad experiences with the aquaculture on the land side for issues I won't really get into, except for the fact that it's pretty much too expensive really for it to get going for because of a lack of suitable food. For mariculture, there are certain things that we're looking into, such as the development of seaweed farming, uh, shellfish production, um, and uh, sea cucumber production as well, because there's a large market in Asia for that. I go diving in Haiti all the time, and I can't remember the last time I saw a sea cucumber, because they've been wiped out by, again, the harvesting for, for markets in Southeast Asia. So there are great possibilities. Um, we have a couple of companies that are really, really interested in coming into Haiti and starting uh, large multi-million dollar fish farms offshore. Uh, and we're still looking into that. 
Um, but there is definitely a good possibility. The better answer to that is, of course, it is possible, but it's best if we can manage what we have already rather than having to go into other processes which may alter the ecosystems and cause more trouble than they're worth. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's see if we have any other questions. My uh, mouse has just given out. Um, okay, do we have another question? Do we have another comment? May I uh, follow up? Yes, can I? So, Jean, um, the things that you just mentioned are obviously for an export market and export tastes. And I wonder if those just increase Haiti's dependency as opposed to its economic independence. And are there projects um, that could restore, you know, Lombi, uh, uh, all the other fish that have disappeared from the Gulf of Lagona? Well, for us, um, everything that I generally do and everything that Football Beam generally does is for local consumption first. We're looking at revitalizing local production um, first, uh, whether it be Lambi shellfish production, uh, the fish farms, um, closing of seasons, uh, education of fishermen and things like that. Our first goal is to make sure that Haitians have enough to eat from our own resources before we look at enriching just a small amount of people for the export market. So it's really, really getting Haiti back on track in terms of its own production to feed ourselves and then worry about potentially trying to help other countries, uh, again, as you just said, probably exploit our own resources. We have to be able to feed ourselves first. And that goes to everything from bananas to eggs to rice to fish. Well, I myself was shocked when I first saw that people were eating tilapia, yep. imported uh, thought out tilapia. Everything, yeah. Like, well, we're, we're importing something around 80 or 90 percent of our fish when certain areas such as up where we are in the three bays with the coral reefs, the seagrass beds, the mangroves and everything, that one area should be able to feed Haiti, feed all of, all of Haiti. So when you're importing buckets full of, of, uh, of uh, herring and other fish, you're, you're a, a Caribbean, a tropical, a Caribbean country with probably the second longest coastline in the Caribbean and you still can't feed yourself with your own resources. So we really, really need to get that under control and the management of course, because it is uh, public access, anybody can go and do whatever they want. Um, it's hard enough for the government to monitor and manage everything on the terrestrial side, let alone in the ocean. Uh, we really, really need to get that under control and again, for us, it's a question of let's feed Haiti first. More questions, more comments from, from anyone, from panelists or questions, uh, chat. I'm looking over here at the chat. Um, we have do we have other questions? Someone who is uh, whose mouse is working, or who's who's uh, all of whose uh, sound and so forth. So we have thirty-one participants, and surely some of them have comments to make: positive, negative questions. Um, can I jump in for a second, LaGrace? I yes, indeed. Just. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, Andrew posed a very interesting question. Yes. Um, so uh, since the drivers of environmental degradation are economic, uh, uh, how can uh, uh, more sustainable uh, livelihoods be made 
also economic. And uh, I'm not an economist, um, but uh, economists talk about incentives. And um, uh, that would be one way to approach it. And there, there, I mean, there's, there's a concept of payment for ecosystem services. So uh, uh, encouraging farmers to uh, uh, engage in uh, uh, more uh, sustainable practices, for example, uh, rather than solely through exhortation and or shaming is to say, well, um, you know, if you conserve biodiversity, we make it worth your while. Um, I, I think that's, uh, that's an approach with, uh, with some merit. Um, and um, uh, I know, I, I, I get the sense Andrew was trying to be provocative because I know he's written quite a bit about this himself too, so. Yes, he does, yes, he does. I'll leave it there. Uh, and and uh, several people, including Karen, uh, asked uh, why uh, Oxfam is closing its office. And hey, we, we are closing a number of offices, and I've mentioned this in the chat. And uh, our other two offices in the Caribbean are also uh, slated for closure. So um, it's simply a process of, uh, you know, we're, 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 we were working in 90 countries and um, uh, we are going to be working in fewer countries. So, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Um, there are a number of other people who might have questions. Uh, please don't be shy. Every question and every comment is worthwhile. As we learn when we try to do things in community, every conversation is worthy. So I would be very happy to uh, uh, entertain any further questions or, or comments. Uh, I, do, I would like to repeat again, I just want to be very emphatic about this, that uh, we are so pleased at Journal of Haitian Studies to be able finally to be able to support a, uh, an environmental studies uh, it, special issue and Rebecca has made the call for papers and we would love to see a great many uh, submissions by the 15th of November. And if you know other researchers whose work would be uh, germane to that issue, uh, please uh, notify them so that they can be in touch with, with Rebecca Sager. And, uh, that's posted on the website and will be posted again. Um, May I jump in here just really quickly? Yes, Rebecca. Okay. Yes, Please. a correction, Rebecca Dirksen, not Rebecca Sager. I know there are two Rebeccas that work on music in Haiti. Make sure you get it to the I right know. Rebecca. <laughs> and you know that I always <laughs> said the wrong name to each one of you. Yes, I have name problem ever since I was five. It's not part of my great age. <laughs> no problem. But while I have the microphone on, I'd like to read a question from Tesha de Vilmar, um, who asks, how, can, uh, how also can we as an association bridge the gap between knowledge and policy or practice? Well, who has an answer to that wonderful question? Can I jump in here? Yes, indeed. This is Gary again. I don't have an answer for that question, but I have a concern. My experience while I was in IT and here in Puerto Rico, people who are doing public policy, especially science public policy, environmental public policy, they're planning for the past. They're not planning for the future. They're not incorporating the best knowledge on climate change on environmental changes, on sea level rises, into their planning. They're trying to fix environmental problems we've accumulated over the past decades, but things are going to get a lot worse. So our planning horizon has to be based on the best knowledge of how things are gonna be in the next 30 years, not how things, the way things were in the last 30 years. I'm in Puerto Rico now and Puerto Rico does this repeatedly we prepare for the past and we never catch up to reality. And I think IT is in the same boat. And I think all of our initiatives should be working on 
incorporating best knowledge of how things are going to change in the future in order to determine what our planning targets are before we start implementing changes? Um, one, one response to that is, again, not, not optimistic. That is the question, and that is the need. I think that would be shared widely, not only by scientists, but a lot of other people who are interested passionately in the environment and know that we have to be looking forward and we have to use the best knowledge that we have. But it is very difficult for people, for any of us, to deal with what is constantly going to be the next unknown. The minute we know a little bit, we want to work with that. We want to work with what we feel so much more comfortable working with what we've already known, what we've already experienced. And it's very difficult for human beings to step out into the void. Um, even with the scientific information that we have, we have projections, and they're very robust projections, but people, those are frightening uh, projections and we don't know quite what to do. So I think a part of the process has to be one of, of reassurance, of saying, okay, we're all in this together, we're all gonna help each other. And that sounds, that's a very little weak statement because you're gonna have to find some robust ways of reassuring people that we can make that step forward step and not be dependent on what we used to know because what we used to know is, is no longer in, in, in at work. I don't know whether that's a good answer or not. It's another thing that says we need to do this, but will we? Some more comments. We have four and a half minutes. There's and, another question. What is the yeah. um, um, vision or mission? How can one contribute? No, I Grace, think I think mission, you should take that. Well, <laughs> I wish I didn't have to because I wish I knew more. I don't know anything, but I do know that uh, we have to hear from everybody. And we have to plan with every piece of knowledge that we have now about how to communicate with people. Um, we have communicated just fine with print, with conferences. Uh, now we're trying to learn Zoom and some of us are really struggling with that, but it's worth the struggle. Um, but we have to find the ways to, uh, to communicate and we have to be very thoughtful about the ways that we are going to communicate so that we're not just uh, branding and advertising and just following the old commercial um, ways that we are used to. We have to find new ways of communicating the urgency of, of this. And part of that is in the way we do our communications and that's under consideration. Uh, we do have the website, we do have the journal, um, we, do, we do have um, Facebook and so on, but we really need to sit down and think through at, at HSA, how do we best use these and how do we have them connect with people who do make decisions? That's the other piece and that's a hard piece. How do you connect if you're not giving huge amounts of money to somebody's political campaign or huge amounts of money to soften a decision from some government agency. And this is true around the world. Every country has this problem. We have to find ways that the, the, the way that the people are speaking and the people's needs connect with the people who are making the decisions. If you have any answers to that question, send us an email. Okay. Anyone else have something to say about that? Something wiser than what I've just said. I hear somebody's mic open. Can I just to emphasize this issue of preparing for the future? Today, yes. the Yucatan, the Yucatan is having its second hurricane in less than two weeks. And this is a category four, yeah. Hurricane Delta. 
that is on its way to Louisiana, which will represent, I believe, the fourth hurricane in, in Louisiana in 2020. Mm -hmm. Things are changing fast, and that's what we have to prepare for. Well, besides battening down the hatches, um, I'm not sure of all the ways that we do that, but I know that everybody who has this panel, uh, uh, Professor Evans, uh, Jerry Gervais, uh, Rebecca, Mark, uh, Jean Wiener, everyone who's contributed uh, has, has put forward some forward-looking uh, forward motions, but now we have to find out how to make the connections and to make those connections operative. So this is, this may be the end of our session for HSA for 2020, but I promise you we will continue and we will try to do work that does connect in places that result in action. That's my promise. And I'm not even running for office. Excellent conference. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone who participated. And you've opened up a wonderful set of questions. And I, I, I really want to thank everybody who contributed to making this possible, the staff, the tech people, uh, uh, Josiane, who translated for us. What a, what a great help that was. So. Thank you all, and we'll see you at one of the other sessions, or we will hear you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you Bye. to everybody. Very Thank informative you, everybody. and promising. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Irene and Josiane, for doing the trends. Congratulations. I know that wasn't an easy task. And Tessa, you did an amazing job. And thank you, Carla. I'm glad to see you here. Thank you. Hi, Evans. It's Gerdes here. Okay. Hi, Gerdes. I'm going to well. I'm going to well. Okay. I'm going to well. 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 Okay, all right. Salut tout le monde qui se Okay, bye bye. All right, bye. Surtout Jacques Edouard. Salut Jacques Edouard, surtout. Non, Jacques Edouard pas en Haïti. Ah, ah, voilà. ah bon. Yeah. Ouais, moi, moi, je suis au Canada, je viens de passer. Oh, yeah. okay, all oui, right. Là, Naturellement. Well, okay. Oui. Yeah. Comment nous y est nous-mêmes? Eh bien, on a été positif par rapport à cette situation difficile et puis on n'a pas passé bataille à continuer. Exactement, à la lutte. Là, mobiliser pour numéro spécial là et. Allez, 